Welcome to the Stalls Heat Press for Profit podcast, a show designed for people who are trying to make it in their heat print hustle. I'm your host, Josh Ellsworth, and we're excited to welcome Nas Rodriguez from Undisputed Custom Uniforms. Hailing from San Antonio, Texas, Nas and his team are on a quest to make every team look great with a custom jersey that inspires and motivates. Nas has grown his business every year, expanded his physical store, and even hired freelancers. We have a lot of discussion planned for today's episode as we explore ideas to take his business to the next level. Nas, welcome to the podcast. Can you spend a minute or two telling our listeners a little bit about your company and your journey into this world of decorated apparel? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me, Josh. Um, So as you mentioned, we do custom team jerseys and uniforms. Um, So we specialize in sublimation of custom uniforms in every sport. And most of our um, business um, is basketball, you know, your main sports, basketball, softball, baseball, things like that. Um, But recently we've wanted to expand into uh, T-shirts and screen printing as something to offer to the parents that want to support their uh, children playing on teams and things like that. Oh, great. And how did you, how, what's some of your background? How did you get into the industry? Actually, it's a long winding story. So <laughs> um, the store actually started off as a sneaker shop about six years ago because I'm a huge sneaker head. Wow. And um, just from there, I kind of, we have a, a the San Antonio Spurs here in town, the NBA team. And um, one playoff run, I decided to design a jersey just for fans that wanted to support the team. And there was such a um, positive response to that that other people started asking me to design things for their teams or their um, school or that kind of stuff. So that's just really what it started was something I just designed for fun for fans to support the team. Oh, great, great. So before we dive too deep, I want to give our listeners an outline of the show in case you're listening for the first time. Uh, The format's simple. We host casual conversations with entrepreneurs like Nas in hopes that we might make a difference in their business and yours. That's it. So sneakers, something close to my heart as well. So do you still have the sneaker uh, part of the shop going? Not really. Unfortunately, what I learned in the sneaker business that if it wasn't... um jordan or if it wasn't yeezy or something like that a lot of people just didn't care what we were trying to specialize in was um a lot of the overseas brands that you see nba players wearing now Mm -hmm. so you know i thought that'd be something unique and stuff but there just didn't seem to be enough interest in it Uh, and did you have a you had a retail space i assume for that business with inventory yes uh uh-huh and you transitioned that space into the uh, jersey business is that right yeah as i mentioned you know i kind of did that first jersey and then people kind of started asking for me to design their team uniforms. And then from there, I started trying to think of maybe other fun designs that my pe- people might like to carry in the store. And kind of that's where we're at now. You know, we've transitioned the store completely to jerseys. So in store, we've got maybe just some like fan designs, fun things that we think people might like. And then we also do the team uniforms. So we kind of have two arms of the business. Yeah, it sounds like a fun business, and uh, you're in the the sports realm still. I can tell uh, based on your interests. Are you uh, kind of a sports fanatic? Would you say? Yeah, especially basketball. You know, I've played all my life. You know, unfortunately, didn't make it to the NBA. Topped out at college basketball, um, but yeah, I still love it. I still watch everything. You know, I've got my league pass where I'll watch even a Charlotte versus Orlando game on a Wednesday night if that's what's on. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I just put something on my bucket list last year to see a game in every uh, NBA arena. So, oh, funny much... that you say no. that. That's what I'm doing. Oh, are you? Okay, cool. Well, we'll have to actually. Um, let's see. February 11th, my wife and I are heading out to go see an Oklahoma City Thunder game. Then from there, we fly to Memphis to see a Grizzlies game, and then back home. <laughs> Oh, that's fun. That's fun. So this year, so far, I caught the Clippers when I was out for the impression show in Long Beach nice. uh, a couple weeks back. And then I caught the Mavericks when we had a the Printing United trade show in Dallas. So oh, I was that's great. Try to hit them in different cities. I but. haven't seen anything on the coast yet. No East Coast or West Coast. So I still need to get to those. Well, come on up. I'm in the Northeast, so All we right. can do it together sometime. <laughs> All right. So everybody doesn't want to hear us talk about basketball all day. So let me get a little bit into the business. Um, So I kind of understand what you're doing. I think you're the first guest that's been on our 
podcast that really um, has done anything in the team uniform space, especially with sublimation. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested to hear how you're positioning sublimation in the business. Are you doing uh, cut and sew sublimation, I assume, and and how that works uh, for your clients? Yeah, definitely cut and sew. So, you know, we're printing the fabric, cut the fabric, um, sewing the pieces together. That way you get an all over design. Um, when we, when I first started moving into sublimation, I tried the, um, sublimating onto pre-made garments and I did not like that at all for the, the finished result. You know, you get those wrinkle, uh, marks or you get those spots where the sublimation didn't take effect because the garment was folded or things like that. So yeah, definitely cut and sew. And, yeah. um, we're positioning that as just the, the superior product, you know, the, we let people know what sublimation is, how it's, you know, an ink that's heated and dyed directly into the fabric and becomes part of the fabric. So there's nothing that you have to worry about cracking or peeling or colors fading or that kind of stuff. So really, we try to educate people on what sublimation is and let them know why it's a, a better product for, especially on, you know, the field or on the court where these uniforms might be taking a beating. Yeah, the uh, the process of sublimation is really interesting, I think, through the eyes of a newbie, um, where you, I mean, just the concept that, well, the fact, not the concept that the ink is actually um, dying and becoming uh, locked in to the polyester fiber. So literally, from a, a durability standpoint and a feel standpoint, uh, it just blends into the garment. There is no feel, and it's highly durable. So definitely, uh, I would say, on the premium side of processes. So I assume that with your design skills and, and what you're setting out to do with your, even your company name says uh, to me that our products are on the premium side are high quality. Uh, are you able to uh, command great prices for this stuff and, and good margins? Yeah, our margins are great. Um, we are looking into a premium fabric so we can offer um, a couple of different options. So maybe if you're just the, uh, the guy that's playing with his friends down at the Y in the rec league, you know, and you don't want to pay a lot for these uniforms. We've got this price point, but if you're a school or a university that needs, um, and higher, um, quality product, then we've got this for you. So that's what we're in the process of trying to improve our uniforms and trying to find a new fabric that we can use. Great. And I know there's quite a bit of investment to get into cut and sew sublimation. Is that something that you are vertical on or desire to be vertical on in the future? You know, I'm not sure. Like we did look into having everything done Mm -hmm. in-house, but not only the cost, but the the time and the expertise needed to use the, the equipment and then having a professional seamstress or actually seamstresses that we would need to sew all these together. Uh, we've found it's actually better to um, outsource to a factory that knows these things inside and out. Good. Well, I, that's that's usually what I hear from most folks is they have a partner that they're able to outsource to. And um, I think that's a that's a strong play, especially if you have the retail space, which would say to me that you're probably strong on the sales and marketing side, or at least that's the focus of the majority of your time. Is that accurate? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, I did hire some freelancers this year because I did want to focus more on working uh, on the business instead of in the business. So um, I used to pretty much handle every aspect of the business, I think, as most small business owners do. Um, And now I've got a social media manager who takes care of posting to social media um, several times a week. Um, I've got a freelance designer who does most of the designs. You know, if it's a a busy month, you know, I'll still knock out some myself. Uh, But for the most part, she's handling most of those now. Great. And so both of those positions are freelancers? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how did you, uh, because I think hiring is is difficult right with carrying uh, a dedicated person uh, an employee there are certain advantages to it um, but then there's also the disadvantages of the the cost factor and freelancers are nice because you can you can work with them pay them uh, per project or a certain amount of time and if it doesn't work out you can easily uh, pursue another option or exit uh, the package so can you just walk me through your thinking on using a freelancer versus hiring Well, as I mentioned, I just wanted to be able to work on other aspects of the business. So I knew I needed to get some help. Um, And freelancer just seemed the most attractive, as you said, you know, somebody that I can bring in quickly. Um, If 
I can train them. We can kind of have a trial period. And if it doesn't work out, you know, they move on, I move on and no fuss, no muss, you know? So, um, there are several sites out there that I've used to look for freelancers. Um, you know, things like Upwork, um, things like, um, free up stuff like that, where you post your job and then these freelancers are able to look at the listings, see if it's something they want to apply for. And then from there you can interview them. You can, um, see if they meet the qualifications that you want for the job and then you can hire them. Great. Well, for our listeners, I think that's an excellent tip. You have some locations where you can search for freelancers. If there's a certain part of your business uh, that you want to partner and outsource, we've talked about manufacturing with cut and sew sublimation, but uh, more than that, also positions like design or social media marketing, that there are a whole network of people out there looking for work that you can employ in your business and complete a more of a traditional interview process uh, as well to make sure that it's somebody that you want associated with your business. So those are great tips and great resources. Yeah. Um, one more thing. I think one of the great things about the, the freelancers or just hiring somebody is, you know, recognizing that I'm not the best at social media, you know, that if it wasn't for the business, I most likely wouldn't even have social media accounts. So I know that's something I'm not good at. So I knew that was something I need to find someone that they are good at that and they specialize in that. So I think that's uh, another tip for, um, small business owners kind of taking stock of what your skills might not entail and finding help in those areas. Great. So walk me through, um, I know you said hired freelancers was one of your big uh, successes of the last year, which I'm sure that's been a, been a load off and going to really set the business up for future growth. As we discussed, uh, you're already experiencing increased sales from year to year. Um, and now you've expanded your physical store. So why was it necessary to s expand the physical store and what did that look like? Um, really the expansion just was because we needed the space, you know, as we were releasing more products, like I said, we kind of have two separate sides of the business, the, uh, custom uniforms for teams and then the, just like kind of fun, casual, like fan wear that we have in the store. Um, and as we were releasing more designs, we just had less places to put it. Um, we needed more space for teams to come in and try on samples so they knew what sizes to order. So really the expansion was just necessary just for the extra space. Great. Are you, um, so of course, coming in to try on stuff, are you doing other uh, unique events or experiences in your store to this point for teams? We haven't yet. That's kind of the next step I want to uh, take, try to figure out what kind of events or, because everything um, now with retail is, you know, what kind of experience can you give your customers? You know, everybody can buy stuff online, but what kind of experience can you give them in person that they're not going to find online? So that's kind of my next step. I just haven't been able to brainstorm what to do. Good. No, I think that'll be an exciting part and a great way to leverage the physical space as an advantage over online retailers or even over home businesses that have the advantage of less overhead. Well, leverage that overhead and create something with it, right? Yeah. Good. And so I know that what attracted, uh, well, what connected us, I should say, um, on this podcast was a conversation over on our Heat Press for Profit Facebook group, where I believe you chimed in on another podcast talking about um, the concept of screen printer or brand. And so I know it seems like you're wrestling with that concept, or maybe you have a very specific point of view uh, on the concept. Can you kind of just outline for our listeners uh, the discussion around uh, being a screen printer versus being a brand? Well, I think I'm kind of wrestling with it. Um, as I mentioned on the, the Facebook group, um, I had a mentor ask me, do you want to be a screen printer or do you want to be a brand? And I had never really thought about it that way. You know, I, um, so far I had just, if anybody came with me to me with, um, you know, their idea for shirts, whether it's for their team or a family reunion or whatever it might be, you know, we, we did that. And then on the side, I was trying to um, brainstorm creative ideas for shirts. And once he asked me that, that kind of really got me thinking, do I, do I want to be a brand? You know, as I mentioned, um, kind of some examples like the old and one trash talk tees or like the Supreme um, tees, kind of stuff that whatever design you put out there, people, people think your brand is so cool and they want to be a part of it that they put it out there. Or do you want to print other people's designs. And yeah, I think I am kind of wrestling with it. And it seems to me, at least on the custom uniform side with looking at your website, it seems like you've are, you're already creating a bit of a brand experience there on that side of the business. Would you agree? 
Yeah, we're trying to. Like, um, you know, definitely there's a, it's a competitive market. So one of the ways we're trying to differentiate ourselves, uh, and as I mentioned, we're trying to look at premium fabrics and how we can improve there. Uh, but the other way is our designs. You know, we're trying to um, have the best designs out there. Our whole marketing is put around um, we can make you look better than your opponent. So that's really one thing that we are trying to do. We're trying to make that as part of a brand. Um, but also, like I said, now with the, the shirts and the screen printing that we've started doing, we're now looking at that. We're looking at that and what can we can do to, um, I guess, make our shirts something cool and desirable that people want to wear. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you already have the, what I always say is it's not about who you are. It's about who your customers want to become. And you're already communicating that message through, um, having the customer look better in the Jersey than the competition where there's a, where there's a competition, right. Um, being the undisputed best looking or, or whatever it may be. But so you have that sort of style that, that inspirational, uh, flair about the company. And so I would think that on the screen printing side and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the screen printing is more geared towards the fanware market primarily. Um, kind of both, you know, really the screen printing we started to have as an add on to the uniforms, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, if a team is coming in and ordering uniforms for their basketball team, we uh, started offering the screen printing as an add on to, you know, as um, um, maybe um, fan and support gear for the parents or things like that. And then once we started offering that as an add on, then since we were already doing fan gear in the sublimation, we started doing fan gear in the screen print as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for every player, there's four or five people in the stands, right? Supporting at least. Yeah. Well, that's what we're hoping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, it's a matter how many of them, they don't have to wear um, the item. So there's a choice in that. So I think your convert rate's lower, but I, I like it conceptually. It's a nice tie off um, to what you're currently offering. Yeah. And, you know, I think the advantage of being a brand, right, is you you build following, people build an affinity for the product line. And so when you have a product release, it just creates um, instant uh, connection to potential buyers because they are actively following and waiting to see what's next. And they want to be associated with that. So that's the advantage of, of brand, of course. But if you just for those startups, especially that don't have regular orders coming in, um, it can cost a heck of a lot of money uh, to build a brand, right? Yeah. And so there's that in between time as you're investing money uh, to build a brand, unless you happen to hit something that catches on instantly and goes viral. Uh, most people don't have that success story. There are some. Uh, you have to build it uh, methodically mm -hmm. over the course of, of many years, um, start grassroots, and then very intentionally expand it out, uh, which can get expensive. And you need to be able to pay those bills um, in the meantime and generate cash flow. So uh, for that reason, I think the just being a screen printer or a heat printer or a sublimator, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's necessary to do some of that just custom work. Um, that's just for that's just for orders and just for profit to keep the business open while you're working on those long term goals. Yeah, definitely. And one of the other slippery slopes that we found with fan gear is, um, you know, we don't use any of the team names, we don't use any logos or anything. Um, but just because you think you're not using any copyrighted images or you're not committing trademark infringement doesn't mean that a team won't send you a cease and desist. You know, we did receive one of those. So you, gotta, you have to watch out with that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that on your very first example for the uh, for the Spurs design that kind of launched you into this whole business. What were what was the creative play you were able to do on that to get around um, some of the licensing? So actually, that one I didn't get around on it. That was my first one. I really didn't think that many people were going to buy it, and I didn't think anybody would ever see it. So, um, sure. So that one I actually did use uh, a team logo on there, which now I don't do that at all. But on that one I did. Um, it was pretty popular, but since then we have not done that at all. We've only done um, a city name. So you know we'll we'll put San Antonio. Um, if any one of your uh, listeners are basketball fans. They might remember the old Spurs Fiesta colors from the nineties. Um, mm -hmm. there's been kind of a clamoring here in town for them to bring those back and they haven't. So we decided to do our own version with those colors. 
but you know they don't own the colors they own their team name they own their logo so we made sure we stayed away from that kind of stuff and those were still pretty popular because people instantly recognize what they are but you know we don't say or put that logo on there yeah i think that's a it's a good point right is uh just the association of the colors especially if it's not in the current vibe and you're starting to see more especially in the basketball space with nba where teams are drawing back to uh, different unique parts of the city and their roots through their city edition jerseys. Yeah. Um, so you're starting to see that, uh, you know, how many, there's probably like five or six Jersey styles, at least for each team. So there's plenty uh, to be able to expand on and, and sort of tap into without having an infringement uh, yeah, issue. Exactly. So the one that we did get a cease and desist on um, for, you know, any listeners out there just to inform them is uh, we used a likeness of a player. So it was, uh, it was an artistic, you know, kind of cartoony drawing of a player. Um, but we were informed by our lawyer that the, just the likeness is still enough to, for them to send those out to you. Did that come from the NBA players association or? No, it actually came from the team directly. The team directly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, yeah. Here at uh, Stalls, we have um, a part of our business that uh, we call our Decorating Fulfillment Center, where we actually do uh, licensed jerseys for a lot of the uh, NBA teams and, and venue clients. So we're a little bit familiar with the space. We don't uh, get into any uh, fan wear at all. It's just the uh, fan jerseys that are licensed by the league. But it's an interesting space, and it's a growing one with a lot of energy. If you look at the size of the league and the growth of basketball, uh, numbers over the years it's it's really a phenomenal opportunity it sounds like you're kind of specializing in that that space those core sports as you mentioned yeah and uh so that does remind me that you guys do the the official jerseys when it comes to a uh, question time remind me about that because i've got a question on that <laughs> all right i'll do my best all right so um good we we're able to spend uh 20 minutes or so just uh chatting through various discussions that's the the purpose of the show but i want to make sure we get to some of the challenges that you have outlined that are facing your business right now. And so one of those was uh, creating original designs for the t-shirt side of the business. Um, we've been saying screen printing a lot. I just want to verify this is the the Heat Press for Profit podcast and uh, screen printing, uh, sublimation. There's a lot of different ways to customize a shirt. Outside of sublimation, what ways are you actually utilizing in the business? So when I say screen printing, uh, I mean really the transfers that I'm getting from you guys. Um, Great. So, yeah, when we started wanting to go into uh, screen printing, we've tried a bunch of different uh, samples. And really, honestly, the uh, the hot split from you guys, uh, I love those. Like, it it gives me the, the closest thing to a sublimation feel where it doesn't feel like it's anything on the shirt. So that's what we've been using. Yeah, I think hot split is uh, underutilized generally by our customers. Uh, we tend to see the most goof proof, which is basically for those listening that don't know what this means, that's our ink formula with a powdered adhesive that gives really good opacity, but uh, most popular will work on anything, but has a little bit more of a feel on the shirt. And what Nas is referencing is a product that's basically just the ink without a powdered adhesive. So the advantage is when you heat press these hot split screen printed transfers, it blends into the fabric. You lose a little bit of the opacity but it does look like uh, traditional screen printing. And you see a lot of shirts out there in retail with that styling anyways. Yeah. And as far as the opacity, we really haven't had any kind of problem unless we're doing a design with a, a light color. Um, you know, I'm actually wearing one right now with a heat, a hot split transfer on it where I got uh, like a light gray and a darker gray onto a black shirt and no problem at all with opacity on that. Good. Yeah. I just did a job for, Um, an awareness thing where I did white ink onto a blue shirt. You got just a little bit of show through, uh, but honestly, it's nothing that I I don't think any consumer would ever complain. I put out about 60 shirts with it, didn't get one single complaint on it. So I think the only time you got to watch is if you're dealing with a, a corporate brand logo or something like that. That's, that's not so much fashion. That's more function for uniforms. Yeah, exactly. And since we're trying to do kind of a fashion line with, with our shirts, um, the, the hot split really worked the best for us. We wanted to really give somebody something that feels good and that can command, you know, a higher price since we're trying to build uh, a, a fashion brand on that side. Great. So talk to me what your struggles are with creating original designs for the t-shirt side. 
Well, kind of like what I was talking about, it's just wrestling with, is that the way I should go? Because as you mentioned, you know, it could take a, a lot of money and a lot of time and you're really just hoping that your, your item hits it big. Um, and then really um, the time part too, you know, there's, those are things that I could be working on other aspects of the business instead of sitting in front of my Adobe Illustrator racking my brain for a design idea. So, yeah. Are you designing your custom uniforms or are you working through a freelancer on that? Uh, as I mentioned, the freelancer handles most of the uniform designs now. Um, Design. During okay. a, a busy season, you know, I'll be knocking some out as well. But for the most part, the freelancer handles the the uniform designs. But for the 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 fashion shirts or the I guess the casual shirts, those I'm doing all myself. Yeah, I think it, it may be kind of interesting if you served up the jersey design and then just associated, I would say one to two. Uh, t-shirt design looks and so of course the most costly part is the design time and creating that original design but then just merchandising that design across uh, a t-shirt uh, a fleece uh, something like that I really think that if a if a team is getting a bid on the jersey they're going to move forward and, and purchase that perhaps and then having the fan shirt be presented right in that moment and maybe just positioning it not only can you buy this but you can sell this right? As a fundraiser, uh, if you're dealing at the high school level, certainly they're always interested in fundraising. If you're dealing at the collegiate level, uh, perhaps it's just more about the brand marketing and having the fans be in something that coordinates to what's on court. Yeah, definitely. I started um, taking a look at the catalog you guys offer online, the uh, Easy Prints, I believe it is, mm -hmm. easyprints.com. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you guys have so many just stock designs ready to go that just need a uh, a team name changed or things like that, that I think we're going to start offering that to, to customers to look at. I guess that's another question I had. It's just like your, uh, your catalog is so immense. I'm afraid to overwhelm customers. Would you suggest maybe just pulling out a few of those designs and offering those up to them as a choice? I, I definitely would. In my experience, the more you can, tailor it to the customer, the better the conversion rate gets. And I have a really good example of, of some AB testing that I tried. Uh, this was in the dance studio market, but it's a, I think it's a relevant story anyways. So if you give them all the choice, um, they're probably not going to be able to arrive at a decision that's been pretty well documented in any shopping experience. Yeah. The choice paralysis. Uh, yep, exactly. And so you probably know that firsthand in retail for sure. Uh, so one, one exercise I did is I prospected about 10 dance studios, um, in the Pittsburgh region to try a concept. I drafted a, a letter and I sent them a direct mail piece. Uh, one of those direct mail pieces had a shirt that was personalized to them that was actually decorated in, in their colors and their style. And another uh, version of the direct mail piece just had uh, a generic design basically not personalized to the, to their particular studio or their colors, uh, because naturally that was easier for me to produce. I didn't have to create a unique design, but the conversion rate when I tailored it completely to them was 70% versus 20% when right. I did not tailor it. So the, the Delta of 50% on the convert rate, I'm not saying you experience that type of success, but I'd say the closer you can get to personalize to them, the better. Um, I think if you just personalize the design in easy view, which is the designer and at least change it to their name and colors. And even if it's a virtual mock-up, I think you'll see an, uh, a much higher increase because you're the design expert, you have the creative eye. So you're helping the customer. Um, and, and really they'll, they'll value that as services, even though it only took you probably two minutes to lay it out with our designer, they'll think you've spent this immense amount of time and there's value in that. And that can help you uh, build that connection. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think that's something we'll have to look into because, you know, when somebody requests a, a design for their uniform, we send them a, a mock-up for them to approve. Maybe at the same time, we send them a couple of shirt options as, hey, you want to add this on? Yeah, they're, they're writing a check, right? So it's better if they only have to go ask for the approval and the money once. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and so I think you'd see your average sale increase if you start to do that. Okay. Yeah, definitely. We'll have to take a look at that then.
Okay. You got to report back to us. Let us know if that works. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of the other things you had mentioned, I, I feel like one of the other challenges you outlined was attracting customers. So I know you've made the decision to bring on a freelancer on the social media uh, side of things. Are you seeing improvement from that right away or is it too early to tell? Um, I don't know. I guess I need to narrow down um, what would be successful there. Mm -hmm. So we are getting a lot more engagement. We are getting a lot more um, likes onto our Facebook and Instagram pages and follows and that kind of stuff. Um, but those aren't becoming leads that could become orders. So I don't know if right now we should just focus on brand awareness and growing the accounts and you know getting our company name out there or if I should worry about trying to make uh, get more leads from social media. So I guess that's another thing I'm kind of wrestling with. So my opinion is, and we struggle with this a lot as a company too, right? Because of course the ultimate goal is to get people to buy your product, right? That's at the very end of the journey. But in my opinion, every buyer uh, does have a journey uh, for your product. And that journey starts with needs awareness uh, in almost any buying cycle. And so basically, if you put yourself in the buyer's shoes, basically that means that the buyer becomes aware that they have a need, whether that's a need for a custom uniform or a cooler looking uniform or even a cooler looking t-shirt or a fundraising program, whatever it may be. You have to define kind of what those needs are. And I think having a strategy that first focuses on getting potential buyers into uh, your sales pipeline and, and making them aware of it, a need is important. So I like the strategy of using your marketing dollars to build engagement and build following and making those buyers part of a community that you continually can communicate with. So this podcast is a great example of how we do that. We try to put out content uh, out there and stories of entrepreneurs in a way that uh, builds following and builds audience. Hopefully somebody subscribes on wherever they listen to podcasts. And now I have the ability to talk to them at least twice a month for 45 minutes and they have the ability to learn and, and that sort of thing. So I like the idea of measuring success by likes um, as a first step or following, uh, depending on what it is. But then after that, I think the key is that you have to ask yourself is, have I put them somewhere where I'm building community and engagement? And so making sure that it's not just a one-way conversation, that you have the folks that are liking the page or becoming a member of the group, uh, communicating and participating in the conversation. And so do you feel like you're, you're building community um, on your Facebook page or Instagram page, wherever uh, folks are following you? Um, somewhat because we try to mix up our posts with, uh, you know, it's not just all product posts or hey, take a look at our awesome stuff and come buy it. You know, it's a lot of, hey, here's a, a cool clip from last night's game or here's a poll question or things like that. So I think there's some uh, community, but I don't know how much of it is just, you know, somebody saw that question while they were scrolling through their feed. And so they decided to just tap an answer and they really don't know who who put that question up there or what, you know? Yeah. So I, you know, it sounds like there's a, there's, there's good engagement. So I would challenge you to try to keep, keep that conversation going. And then I think once you have that conversation going, like maybe one out of every five times, you can uh, post something that gives the customer the opportunity to, to click through and maybe not buy, but at least uh, collect their information and say that I'm interested. Like maybe a zero risk quote, you know, a free mock-up, one free mock-up by responding to this post. So I think maybe a little softer uh, step through the funnel where they move out of that needs awareness category yeah. and they actually move into inquiry should be your goal where they're reaching out to you and saying, I'm interested in something, at least in learning how much this would cost. Yeah, that's something too, you know, kind of looking at the way you guys do things with the, uh, all the information you put on, on the YouTube videos and like you said, now the podcast, uh, that's something kind of we've been looking at too. Maybe just a couple of videos of this is what sublimation is and here, learn more about it. And like you said, just kind of educate the customer more and hopefully that moves them farther down the line of, okay, I'm ready to order now. Yeah, and I even think if you're trying to build the brand and you're coming up with some cool designs and you, you have a community of like-minded individuals, um, 
So what I mean is maybe there's maybe there's a page you have where folks have an affinity to basketball, another page where it's softball, whatever it may, because I think the audience has uh, different needs and interests. Mm -hmm. Then you can start to post maybe original T-shirt designs that are the shirt of the month, or maybe there's an exclusive print quantity of only 100 shirts and be able to collect those orders, especially if you have an online platform um, and fill them after you've collected all the orders or on demand. Okay. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. Yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to get to. I mean, we're trying to get to the point where if we're only releasing a hundred of something, we want a fervor of people wanting to get those. Yeah, you know, it's a sneaker market, right? It's why people line up for uh, the latest releases and there's about a hundred releases a week, it seems like anymore. Yeah. So uh, building that type of demand, I think is aspirational, but if you can get a fraction of that, it would be great. And yeah. so you know, I've talked to some businesses that will do stuff even around around those shoe releases, being inspired by the colors, which has seemed to be a successful strategy. Yeah. Okay. So I want to make sure um, that I that I get to this because you seem like you're doing well in the business, which congratulations on that. You're thinking about the business, which is great, and you have great perspective. So for those folks that may be listening that want to start, whether that's a open a retail store or maybe just start a business in the sportswear space, what would be some advice that you would share with them if they're just getting started? Um, I would really just say get started. Um, I had, I've kind of been a serial entrepreneur and this is my, I don't know, seventh business maybe in all my lifetime. <laughs> so um, wow. yeah, and this is the first time I've actually had a retail store and I've noticed the difference in having that space. Um, you know, a lot of times I kind of just wanted to start from home and I didn't want to spend too much money and that's understandable, but I felt like the business couldn't, didn't become what it could become until I had an actual space where people can come see my products. And as much as people, um, shop online, it still seems, especially in this type of item. Um, and even before when it was sneakers, people want to come take a look at it. They want to feel what it what the fabric feels like, they want to try it on, that kind of stuff. It just seems people are more um, trusting of a, a business that they can actually walk into. Yeah, that's that's daunting for some people, but I agree. It says that you're committed, right? right. It, it establishes instant credibility uh, as a business, um, but it's daunting for some because then they have to work retail hours and, and they have a bill. So I think uh, yeah. of a lease, but I think that's a, that's the separation, right? And and if you're leveraging that and your customers are getting that experience and seeing that, uh, it's, it's a great benefit, I would agree. Yeah, and if you can get started and only work a few days, I mean, that's how I started. I um, was in the corporate world. I worked at um, Apple corporate headquarters in Austin, Texas. And uh, when I had the idea for the sneaker shop, and I could only open up, you know, a couple of days a week. And that's what I started with until finally I could... Um, I decided to leave the, the corporate job. And so, I mean, if that's what you can do, if you can only do a few days a week, I would suggest definitely doing it. Um, if your product lends itself to something that people want to come and look at and feel and touch. Good. And your store location, like where you're situated in, in town or location, can you give us any advice or picture of that? Yeah. Um, it's kind of perfect really. Cause we are at the uh, intersection of two major highways here in San Antonio. And then we've got a, a major road that passes by us, and uh, we're inside a mall. So um, it was kind of an older mall that six years ago when we were looking for a retail space, uh, they had lost all their major tenants. So they were looking for ways to revive the mall, and the way they were doing that was offering smaller spaces to um, to small businesses, to small local businesses. So we were able to get in there and, you know, over the years, they've done a great job of building the mall back up. So now all of a sudden you've got this cool eclectic mall of, you know, local businesses that you're not going to find anywhere else. And, and I always thought it would be a good spot because of the, uh, the highways. So yeah, it's turned out as the, the kind of the traffic and interest in the mall kind of grew again. And now people have an easy way to get there. That's excellent. And I know that, um, we publish all of these on our Heat Press for Profit podcast. So, um, Naz, I'm going to ask you for a favor. If you have any photos of the inside of your space when we release this podcast, if you can share those in the conversation thread over there, I think people would be really anxious to 
to kind of see what you're operating with there and understand how you laid out the space. Okay. Yeah, definitely. All right. So now I'm going to flip it over to you. You said remind you of a question. Yes. Um, so any questions for me? I'm just curious of what type of transfers go on to those like professional level jerseys. Cause, um, you know, when I look at a, an NBA, like authentic Jersey, I notice you know, nothing is embroidery like it used to be, which, which I understand cause they're trying to take weight off of the, uh, off the player, but it does seem like it's just a, a transfer. And I've always wondered what kind of transfer do they put on these professional level jerseys? Sure. Yeah. And if you just let's focus on NBA, I think that's probably the most variety and easiest to explain. Um, on the authentic side, believe it or not, uh, it's a tackle twill uh, base material. So a polyester based twill. Um, typically on the authentic side, some teams will have that twill uh, perforated. So it does make it lighter weight and a little bit more breathable, certainly for the on-court stuff and even for the authentic fan jerseys. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on the authentic side, we are actually still uh, sewing that twill um, down to the garment. However, uh, I would say the swingman jersey, which for those that don't know the basketball jerseys, that's your middle tier. And it comes in, again, a variety of flavors and colors. Uh, you're still getting the same twill, but it's a sublimated twill. And so rather than having to sew the numbering down to the jersey and have that extra step in the process, like the quality that you get on an authentic, um, basically we're taking a white polyester twill. Uh, it's a polyester base, so it does work with the sublimation process that we documented earlier. The ink is sublimated and it actually dies into the twill, which means it can't be scratched off and you can do things like you know, two, three color numbers all on a single layer or, or color gradients. You're starting to see a little bit more of that. Sometimes even sublimating the concept of a perforated effect into the numbers. So you can really get creative with the design on the sublimated twill. And then uh, after it's sublimated, because it is just heat applied, um, you need to make sure that it has a uh, permanent adhesive on it. So a good example of that would be the perma twill that we sell at stalls. It already comes with a permanent adhesive. Um, and you want to be careful about uh, knife cutting it because it is not getting sewn at the edge, so it doesn't fray. Uh, you want to use a, a laser cutter. So there's some higher-end equipment similar to cut and sew sublimation where you have to register the sublimated twill okay. um, for cutting. Um, and then just, just heat apply it on. And so the cool part about that is not only can you... Uh, decorate the on-court players, you know, when Damian Lillard drops 50 points, right, and everybody wants his jersey, yeah. and, the, and the arena needs to order more, but you can do personalization. So if a fan wants to put their name and number, um, that's something as well that most of the arenas are doing right, arenas are doing right there inside of the stadium on a, on a Hotronics heat press. Okay. So I, I know you guys have the, uh, the letters and numbers ready to order. Do you, any of those letters and numbers come in these, um, these products that you were talking about, the Perma Twill or anything that's more professional like that? Well, right now what we have is we carry uh, the sublimated twill. It's called CAD Prince Perma Twill. Um, that would be the same exact uh, finish and feel as you're seeing on those jerseys. The best example would be the Sponsor Patch, which mm -hmm. is also a sublimated twill. Um, I would say currently with our process, at least to the decorator community, um, it's not set up ideal for uh, names and numbers, but that's certainly an opportunity I think we'll pursue as a company. Oh, okay. But but for basic custom logos, absolutely. And you could always upload your own custom numbering as well if you wanted. Okay, good to know. Like I said, that's always kind of just been a, a curious thing. I, and I see them do that in, in arenas where they, like you said, they customize a, a fan's name onto an authentic jersey or onto a, one of those swing man. I'm like, what are they putting on there? Yeah, and believe it or not, have you seen our Spirit Sale software yet? Um, no, you guys sent me the uh, a link for a demo, and I just never got around to trying it out. So, fun fact is that uh, platform that we've built on Spirit Sale has been driving a lot of those customization stations inside of arenas for the past ten years. Oh, really? So, it's kind of cool uh, concept, especially when you think of your retail space. You know, as that product progresses. Think of the idea of having a touchscreen kiosk inside of your retail store where buyers can come in and personalize and, and kind of create looks that you can press on the spot. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's one of the ones I have not seen yet. I have not seen the kiosks in person. I, you know, I haven't been to a, an arena that has one of those yet. 
Good. Well, there's, uh, let me think, where, where did you say you're heading? Oklahoma City and Memphis. Either, okay. Well, either one have one? You'll de- I have to reference my list, but I'm, I guarantee we're probably in one of the two at least. Okay. <laughs> Potentially both. Um, but I know for sure there's a ton of teams that are utilizing it. For instance, uh, in the Staples Center, they had one uh, that I was able to take a look at inside of their fan shop. Nice. I'll have to take a look when I head out to L.A. one day. Okay, good. So I know we're coming up towards the end of our time. Any other uh, questions that you have for me before we conclude? No, I think that's it for now, Josh. I'm sure I'll think of something else later on, but that's all I can think of right now. Well, you know where to find me, right? In the yeah. in the Heat Press for Profit Facebook group. So uh, really great conversation. Nas, thanks for joining us uh, today. Oh, thank you and for having me. This was fun. Yeah, it's a good time. And we wish you tons of success as you look to kind of become a brand uh, in this uh, fan apparel, as well as expand your uniform business and keep growing it with everything you're trying to accomplish. And for those listening, if you found something interesting on today's show, uh, please feel free to head over to the Heat Press for Profit group and, and comment on it. Um, ask a question to Nas. Ask a question uh, to me. There's tons of conversation that happens uh, over at that group every day, and that's where we post all of these podcasts so you can binge listen. So we want to thank you so much uh, for listening today, and we want to encourage you to give us a five-star rating wherever you're listening to your podcast, and make sure you leave a review as well. That helps us to reach more entrepreneurs that want to grow their business just like you. Thanks for listening to the Heat Press for Profit podcast. Oh, 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 oh,